important notes about online learning. On the course page, you'll find a very useful document with some hints and tips on how to manage your data and to reduce your data consumption. Download the slides and go through them along with the video or audio, and please pay special attention to the lecture outcomes. The outcomes tell you what you need to be able to do in order to pass the assessment. This means that the outcomes define the scope of your assessment. You still need to make notes and try and express things in your own words, and this is going to be very important for your own understanding. You still need to go through the prescribed reading and do the exercises, and you still need to explore further through additional reading, online investigation, for instance, YouTube has some wonderful linguistic resources. Remember that your evidence of engagement will all be part of your portfolio. Every lecturer hopes that all students do these things anyway. But when you are doing online learning from home, the opportunities to do so are quite different. It becomes even more important that you do these things. You will need to manage your own time and take responsibility for your own learning. Hold tight and enjoy the lecture. We started out in the first term looking at some of the formal characteristics of language and one of those characteristics is asymmetric hierarchical structure. So we spent the next little bit of time looking for evidence of the structure, uh, primarily focusing on this theoretical notion of C command. We looked at polarity items, we looked at binding and reference, and we looked at minimality and movement. And so those are three empirical areas which give us an idea of the evidence of C command and thereby for hierarchy. What we're going to be looking at now is evidence for constituency and this you would have covered in Linguistics 1. So there's a little element of recap to this but the textbook also goes into a lot more detail as will we. There are also a number of recommended readings for this week primarily from the prescribed reading Heigemann. There are some other helpful readings uh, which two of which might not be available through the, through the library at this point, but also pointing you to more of the Hagemann readings. Generally, the more of the Hagemann textbook that you can do, the better. But I have tried to highlight certain parts that seem to hang together and make sense. I'm also recommending you do the exercises in Chapter 2. I have outlined some. You are, of course, able to do as many as you like. And these all form part of your portfolio. So in Linguistics 1, you would have covered a number of diagnostics for constituency, for instance, substitution, movement, question formation, ellipsis, focalizing, clefts and pseudoclefts, coordination. And those are the, probably the ones we covered in Linguistics 1, but there are many, many more. In fact, each language, depending on its structure and the constructions it allows, ends up having slightly different options for tests that you can apply. You know, so I'm assuming you know what these tests are. If you need a refresher, please read the chapter in the textbook and or go and uh, listen to the corresponding Linguistics 1 lecture. What we're going to do in this lecture is take a very simple sentence like the customer will order the drinks before the meal and we're going to be running this construction through a number of these tests so that we can try and work out uh, what the constituents are. So constituents, as you will recall, are chunks of language that hang together in ways that suggest that they are part of a slightly bigger structure. Of course, we can't see the structures directly, uh, but we can see the effects insofar as we can see the word orders. So let's start off with applying the substitution tests. So what we can do is to try and substitute pronouns. The customer will order the drinks before the meal, can be substituted with a number of pronouns. For instance, she will pay for them later. And everything that you can replace with a pronoun is probably a constituent of some point. So it suggests that the following are constituents, namely the customer, the drinks, and before the meal. Having done linguistics one, you'll already be able to recognize that these are two noun phrases and a prepositional phrase, respectively. But for the moment, we, we don't have to assume that. We can just uh, say the evidence shows that those are a constituent of some kind. Another kind of substitution test is the do-so test, which replaces verbal elements and events. So the sentence, do you think the customer will order the drinks before the meal, can be answered in the following way. Yes, she certainly will do so, or yes, she certainly will do so before the meal. What does this suggest is that order the drinks before the meal is a constituent, and order the drinks is itself a constituent. So putting 
This evidence together, we can show the following kind of structure. We order the drinks before the meal is a constituent, but within that there's another constituent. This is going to be evidence for hierarchy. Another test we could apply is question formation. For instance, we could ask a number of open-ended questions using WH words about that scenario of the customer ordering the drinks before the meal. We could say, what will the customer order before the meal? What will the customer do? What will the customer do before the meal? Who will order the drinks before the meal? When will the customer order the drinks? What will the customer order the drinks before? Etc. In each of these instances, what's really happening are two things. One, we've substituted some category or other with a question word like what, who, when. So that is a type of substitution occurring. The other thing that's happening is that the question word or the question phrase is moving to the front of the sentence, leaving a gap where it had originated before. Taken together, this shows that the following are constituents. The drinks, the customer, the meal, order the drinks before the meal, order the drinks before the meal. In fact, whatever can be substituted by the question item. We could also apply ellipsis in the same way. For instance, take the sentence, will the customer order the drinks before the meal? We could reply with something like, yes, I think she will. What is it that is being elided here? Well, it's a set of words, order the drinks before the meal, which we can then take to be a constituent of some sort. Just to show you that there are some limitations in what you can elide. You can't just elide willy-nilly unless what you're eliding are constituents. So, for instance, yes, I think she will order the is ungrammatical, namely because drinks before the meal is not a constituent. Or put in another way, there is no constituent that includes drinks before the meal but somehow excludes the article the. Another ungrammatical one, yes, I think she will order the drinks before. So in this case, what is elided is the meal, which is actually a noun phrase, as we know from the previous test. So this doesn't show that the meal is not a constituent. I think what it rather shows is that there are some limitations on what you can elide and what not. For instance, maybe there is a limitation on eliding a noun phrase inside a prepositional phrase, stranding the preposition. So that is something to keep in mind. What does it show? That the following is a constituent, namely, order the drinks before the meal. And it also shows that drinks before the meal is not a constituent. The next test we can look at is fronting. Fronting is when you take some constituent, move it to the front of the sentence, usually for emphasis. Sometimes uh, that emphasis is called focus, when it's a new information you want to introduce. Sometimes it's called topic, when you just want to emphasize old information before you introduce the new information. So we could say something like, the drinks, the customer in the corner will order before the meal, but the dessert they will order later. In that case, the noun phrase, the drinks, has been fronted. Before the meal, the customer will order the drinks. What has been moved is a string of words before the meal, which we know to be a prepositional phrase. She wants to order drinks before the meal and order drinks before the meal she did. This is a type of embedded fronting where what's being fronted is a verb phrase, order drinks before the meal, as well as the prepositional phrase that is attached to it. And it's not fronted to the front of the whole sentence, but rather fronted to the front of the embedded sentence following the coordinator and. What does this show? That the following are constituents. The drinks, the meal before the meal, and ordered drinks before the meal. Some of these should be familiar from the previous tests that we've applied. Putting this together, we get a structure as shown at the bottom of that slide. What you'll start to see is what we call embedding, where we have constituents placed inside constituents. And these are represented as a set of brackets, but you can also draw these as a tree. If you want to see what this looks like as a tree, you can take this exact string and put it into the tree drawing website that I have mentioned on Slack. Coordination. That's going to be our next test. Coordination has a number of interesting properties. Uh, for instance, the things that are coordinated have to be of the same type or the same kind of category. And following William's work in the 1980s, we would call this the law of coordination of likes. So, for instance, we can modify the sentence a little bit. The customer will order the drinks before the meal can be modified in some interesting ways. You can say the customer and the business tycoon will order drinks. Or the customer will order drinks and drink cocktails. The customer will order the drinks before the meal and after the show. The customer will order the drinks before the meal and the dessert after the show. 
These are all different types of coordination constructions, and there are presumably quite a few more. What it shows is that coordination can coordinate at a number of different levels, at the noun phrase level, at the prepositional phrase level, at the sentence level, at the verb phrase level. And it doesn't seem to really care what level it's coordinating at, so long as what is being coordinated in both conjuncts is of the same kind of category. So it's actually quite a powerful kind of tool. And it shows that the following are constituents. The customer is the same type of category as a business tycoon. Um, if we know that one is a noun phrase, then they are, it follows that they are both noun phrases. Order cocktails is the same type of category as drink cocktails. So if you know that drink cocktails is a verb phrase, it follows that order cocktails must be a verb phrase too. Before the meal is of the same type of category as after the show. Again, if you know what one of those categories is, you'll be able to infer the other one. It will also show, I think, interestingly, that the drinks before the meal is a constituent in the same way as the dessert after the show is going to be a constituent. One could, of course, go through the other tests as well, and I would encourage you to do so, just to practice your own uh, technical ability to do so. But putting all this together, we've got enough to construct some kind of constituency structure, and this is drawn up on the slide as some kind of tree. And it hasn't got any labels yet because we haven't really argued for any labels. All we've done is show that there are certain strings of text that cluster in particular ways. And what you can do is take the, the bracket notation that we have at the bottom of the screen, and you can cut and paste that into the syntax tree drawing website that I put up on Slack, and it should, should draw something a little bit like this. We do, of course, want to go a little bit further because it's all very well saying that there are these chunks that, that pattern together, but what are those chunks? What would we call those chunks? Again, thinking back to Linguistics 1, we took up the following. We said, well, the whole thing, thing together is a sentence, so let's call that S. And we also adopted something called the headedness principle, which is the idea that each structure has a main part or something called the head. The head is the item that gives the structure its name. So, for instance, a noun phrase is headed by a noun. A verb phrase is headed by a verb. A prepositional phrase is pre headed by a preposition, etc. Maybe what's interesting to note is that S does not seem to obey this generalization. So, it's not that the sentence is headed by this category called S. So, this looks a little bit anomalous, which leads to some criticism of this kind of approach and that's something we might want to return to later. So just adding the category names based on the items that are inside the categories we get something like the following tree with the appropriate node labels. So that's as, you, as far as you would have gotten in Linguistics 1. What I'd like to do in the remainder of the lecture is to take some of the stuff that we learned in previous weeks uh, largely about C command, and to see if, if we can make any predictions about the C command relationships that exist in this tree. An important idea here is that a tree is not just something you draw on paper, but is actually an analysis of a construction or an analysis of a particular piece of language. And as such, it is also a hypothesis about the structure that we're dealing with, which means that it should be able to make some predictions, and those predictions should ideally be borne out by the facts. So let's try and make some predictions. First of all, let's examine the idea that the auxiliary is hierarchically superior to the verb phrase. So according to our tree, the auxiliary is higher than the verb, insofar as the auxiliary C commands the verb. And taken together with some of our previous ideas about syntax that we've been learning in previous lectures, this could make a prediction that if one of them moves, it will be the auxiliary and not the verb. Now, why would we want to say that? Well, because movement needs to be motivated, and it's motivated by a set of interpretable and uninterpretable features. So if there is a, a movement feature, say, that needs a verb in order to be satisfied, and let's imagine that that uh, feature is at the root of the sentence, Another way of saying that is that at the top node of the S, and that feature were to look down into the tree using C command. This is a process called agree, by the way. So if this feature looks down into the tree, then the first thing it's going to see, as it were, will be the auxiliary, because auxiliary is hierarchically higher. So we expect a minimality effect with respect to the auxiliary in the verb. So let's see if that is, plays out in reality. 
In yes, no question formation, you can say, will the customer order the drinks? That's grammatical, where the auxiliary is moved to the front of the sentence. But it is ungrammatical to move the main verb across the auxiliary, yielding, order the customers will the drinks. We can see a similar effect in question formation. What will the customer order? Where the uh, modal has moved up to the second position in the sentence. Incidentally, the question word what is also moved to the front, leaving a gap. Um, but in the same context, we cannot move the main verb into the second position, yielding what order the customer will. It doesn't seem to make much sense. So, indeed, if one of the verbs has to move, it's going to be the highest verb, which is auxiliary in this case. So, our prediction is confirmed. Let's apply some of the binding tests to our noun phrases and to work out which ones are higher. According to our structure, the subject noun phrase, the customer in the corner, is C commands every other noun phrase in the sentence, but the direct object and the object of the preposition do not C command the subject. Similarly, the direct object appears to C command the prepositional phrase, but not the other way around. So our, our tree structure predicts that the subject C commands the object, and the object C commands a prepositional phrase. And let's try some of our binding principles to see if that's indeed the case. So we can modify our original sentence and put an anaphore into it. So we would get something like, the customer will order a picture of himself before the meal. The anaphore himself is mediated by principle A, which says that there needs to be an antecedent in the same clause. So in this case, it would be the customer that would be the antecedent of himself, and that's grammatical, which suggests that the customer C commands himself. Himself will order a picture of him before the meal. Here we have a situation where we have attempted to put the anaphore in the subject position. If it were the case that the direct object C commanded the subject position, which it doesn't, but let's just pretend for a moment that it does. If it were to be the case that the object C commands the subject, then the next, that sentence would be grammatical because the object would be a suitable antecedent for the anaphore. The fact that it is ungrammatical shows us quite clearly that the subject noun phrase is not C commanded by the object. Let's try an example of principle B. Principle B says that any pronoun in the sentence must not have an antecedent in that same clause. The customer will order a picture of her before the meal. In this instance, it would be grammatical if the Customer and her are not the same person. In other words, we say that they are not co-indexed. However, it is ungrammatical if we construe the customer and her to be the same person. Why? Because this would mean that the customer is an antecedent of the pronoun and it is in the same clause which violates principle B. So we predict that to be ungrammatical and that is indeed the case. How about principle C? The customer will order a picture of the customer before the meal. Again, the customer and the customer cannot be the same person. Principle C says an R expression or referring expression must be free, so it cannot have an antecedent. And in this case, if we construed the two customers to be the same person, they would, which then suggests that the noun phrase C commands the direct object. We can also use negative polarity to try and show the same point. We could say no customer can order any drinks before the meal. You should be familiar with these kinds of sentences from uh, term one. That becomes ungrammatical or pragmatically weird if you take the negation out, yielding the customer will order any of the drinks before the meal, and we lose that negative polarity reading, which, again, thinking back to the first few weeks of term, this shows that the subject C commands the object. So what we've been doing here is taking some of the previous stuff we learned, applied it to the constituency structure, and we can see that we can obtain some kind of coherent hypothesis or a coherent kind of theory that comes out of it. So let's look at the relationship between the object and the prepositional phrase. Can we also apply tests to show that the object C commands a prepositional phrase? Let's look at principle A. By modifying our original sentence a bit, we can get something like, the customer will sponsor his daughter with a dessert for herself. And that is indeed grammatical. So why? Well, it must be that his daughter, which is the direct object noun phrase, C commands the noun phrase as the object of the prepositional phrase. If this were not the case, principle A would be violated because there would be no antecedent in the same clause. The fact that it's grammatical shows that 
the object C commands a prepositional phrase. Should we explore this with principle B? The customer will order the drinks at a store for them. This seems to me a little bit odd. If you were to construe the store being a store for drinks, you have a pronoun them, which must not have an antecedent in the same clause. And we're trying to construe drinks and the pronoun them together, and that becomes ungrammatical. Similar logic applies to principle C. The customer will meet Reino at a party for Reino. Sounds very wordy and odd, and that is because you can't have an antecedent in the same clause for principle C, that Reino must be free, and in this case it's not, suggesting again that the object C commands the prepositional phrase. Let's try negative polarity items, just to see if this initial hypothesis is supported by other ways of looking at it. The customer will order nothing for anybody. Nothing is the direct object. Anybody is the object of the preposition. And it's quite grammatical, which shows that the direct object C commands the object of the preposition at some level. It's important to create a minimal pair so we can try and remove the negation and put another kind of quantifier in there. This will deal something like the customer will order something for anybody. And that does have a meaning but it is not the negative polarity meaning. That has a meaning that the customer is not particularly careful about who they order something for and will literally do it for anybody who is in the room. Now that is quite different to the negative polarity reading where anybody rather seems to mean something like somebody. Again, this shows that the object C commands the prepositional phrase. Hmm. We can also look for some minimality effect in question words by substituting a number of noun phrases for a number of question words, we end up with a sentence with more than one question word. Who ordered what before what? And in English, it's a property of the language that a question word must go to the front of the sentence, but only one of them may go to the front. The other ones must remain where they are. So in the sentence, who ordered what before what? The question word that is at the front of the sentence is also the subject noun phrase. So that's the one that's hierarchically highest, and that's exactly what you'd expect if the subject C commands everything else. Let's look at the next example. What did who order before the meal, which is ungrammatical. In this case, we've taken the direct object and moved it to the front of the sentence across the question word in the subject position, and it becomes ungrammatical. And this tells us then that we have a minimality violation. A minimality violation means that a lower node has crossed over a higher node and then this would also support the idea that the subject C commands the object. Now, if you were to take out the question word in the subject position and just replace it by the customer, then we can look more specifically at the interaction between the object and the prepositional phrase. What did the customer order before what is a grammatical sentence? We've taken the direct object question word and moved it to the front of the sentence. Now, in the process, it has also crossed over the subject noun phrase, which is the customer. But what's really important here is that the customer, as a noun phrase, is not a question word. So minimality says you have these violations or problems that occur when you move a category over the same kind of ca category. And in this example, the question word what has moved over an ordinary noun phrase and not across another question word. So there's no minimality violation induced here. Now you want to compare that with the next sentence where we take the object of the preposition question word and we move that to the front of the sentence. What did the customer order what before is ungrammatical, and this would only follow if the object of the preposition is C commanded by the direct object. If it were the case that the direct object did not C command the prepositional phrase, then there would be no minimality violation. So this is good evidence that the direct object C commands the prepositional phrase. So summarizing, we've used a variety of tests to show the constituents of a sentence, and we use these to formulate an initial idea about the sentence structure. Then we went ahead and tested this structure C command properties with a variety of tests, including negative polarity, binding, and minimality. So in this way, we were integrating the stuff that we learned last term into the hypothesis about the structure that we are building. Based on this broad range of mutually reinforcing evidence, we can come to the conclusion that a tree like what we learned in Linguistics 1 is more or less correct. And in the coming weeks, we're going to be looking at that tree in more detail and modifying it and coming to a new idea about what the sentence structure might look like.